thank you all for taking the time to listen to my talk today. Uh, and I would, of course, be very excited to hear your questions at the end, as well as any other thoughts you have. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll be telling you about some of the work that we've been doing here at Georgia Tech in some of these areas. So a couple of things up front. So in addition to my role at Georgia Tech, uh, I'm involved in a couple of different startups. And so, of course, I have to disclose those up front. I'm actually the co-founder for a company called CardioSense that has licensed our IP uh, related to cardiovascular sensing with these sort of platform technologies that I'll describe in the first part of the lecture uh, and is trying to apply those specifically to heart failure monitoring as a first kind of market. And so uh, that's that's one area. The other thing is that I'm involved with a startup called Arthroba, which is at a newer stage, uh, pre-seed kind of stage, trying to take some of our work and move it into the osteoarthritis as well as uh, sports medicine kind of areas. So a lot of what I'll discuss today is going to focus around the sounds and vibrations of the body. And and really, you know, when you think about maybe sounds of the body, probably the first thing you start thinking about is maybe voice. Um, at the same time, you may think about heart sounds, uh, just because they're sort of prevalent in, in, of course, popular culture. You know, we hear the sort of thump, 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 thump kind of noises from someone's heart in sort of movies and TV shows. And of course, then connect that uh, in our brains is our first sort of thinking process around sounds of the body. But really, as your bodies are performing their normal processes of living, they're generating sounds and vibrations continuously, including from things like the joints, footsteps, and other things that we don't really think about too much. But my lab has really been fascinated by the study of these sounds and vibrations as a way of understanding the inner workings of the body with non-invasive sensors and specifically to complement the existing modalities that are out there that are typically more focused on electrophysiology and kinematics. So I'm really going to talk about two areas today, and one is going to be focused on the work uh, that we've done around cardiovascular sensing, especially focused on vibrations of the body in response to the heartbeat. And the second area will be around joint health monitoring, and that's focusing mainly on the acoustics produced by the knees. So your heart is, of course, centered inside of your chest, sort of to the left side, and every time it's beating, it you can think of your heart as a mechanical pump that's driven sort of by electrical impulses. So there's electrical signals telling it what to do, but every time it beats, it's actually producing some pretty large forces and accelerations that cause your whole body to vibrate. And of course, some of you, if you're laying in bed and you're kind of very still, you've probably felt the whole body vibrations resulting from your heartbeat. If you place your hand over your chest, you can, of course, sense the smaller, maybe seismic vibrations of the chest in response to your heartbeat. But the signals associated with these vibrations have actually been known about for more than 100 years, but they have been studied much, uh, much less so than their counterparts in terms of electrophysiology. In fact, actually, the first systems for measuring these sorts of uh, electrical signals from the heart, we know date back quite a ways, actually, more than 100 years. This is the first kind of electrocardiograph uh, developed by Eindhoven, where you put your hands and feet into buckets of salt water for the transducer, and then it's connected to the string galvanometer. So the history of kind of electrophysiology is known to be rich and quite old. But actually, if you think about mechanical and acoustic measurements of the heart, that dates back another 100 years beyond electrophysiology. So in the early 1800s, this uh, French physician named Lenec came up with this concept that, first of all, they were doing quite a bit of putting their ears on the patient's chest to listen to the heart sounds and lung sounds and try to understand what's going on. But he actually produced this instrument that's not that different acoustically than what we use now for the stethoscope. But essentially, this instrument allowed for them to um, more sensitively listen to the sounds of the heart and try to glean information about cardiac health from those. So the concept of acoustic monitoring of the heart actually dates back further than electrical, electrical measurements. Um, not to say that either one is more important than the other. So we, our latest sort of technology from our lab, and I kind of jumped to the end result here, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what we've been doing with this sort of system. But we built a wearable system that includes both electrical and mechanical measurements of the heart. This was in close collaboration with Mazi Edamati from Northwestern and Levi Klein from UCSF. 
Uh, over the past decade, we've advanced various different iterations of this patch. The first one looked like sort of a maybe an iPhone sized patch that would sit on the center of your chest and take up almost the whole chest. Second version was sort of a circular thing that we used to call the hockey puck because it was kind of the same size as the hockey puck and sort of same form factor. And then the latest version now is this sort of small narrow strip that actually sits right onto your chest that we call Seisma patch in the academic world. Uh, this is what we're commercializing through CardioSense as the CardioTag monitoring platform. Um, and so this device actually measures the electrocardiogram as well as this accelerometer-based signal called the seismocardiogram. So the second waveform you see on the right here is something called a seismocardiogram. That represents the seismic vibrations of the chest wall in response to the heartbeat. Those are on the order of 10 millijes approximately peak to peak, which is basically one one hundredth of the acceleration due to gravity on Earth. So pretty small signal, but but large enough so you can capture it with these low noise accelerometers on board. And then we also measure basically uh, three different wavelengths of light at two different locations. So we get six PPG signals, reflectance PPG signals as well from the chest. And so with this patch, we've done quite a bit of studies trying to assess basically how these different signals uh, correspond to various clinically relevant kind of metrics like cardiac output, um, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and other sorts of measures. And we've published quite a bit of this work in the existing literature, mainly focused on heart failure monitoring at first. Uh, but some of this is also going beyond that into, uh, say, perioperative cardiac surgery patients and, and um, cardiotoxicity of various cancer drugs and that kind of thing. So uh, we, we've also refined at this point kind of a signal processing and data analytics pipeline for dealing with these physiological time series waveform data in our lab. So we've had to kind of normalize the process from what it used to be, which was very much manual kind of hand marking of what, where are the different peaks in these signals, you know, where is the noisy part of the measurement to a more streamlined process where we now kind of filter these signals, we're able to automatically determine the quality of the various measurements and flag basically the corrupted portions of these measures from motion and, and talking and other sorts of uh, corrupting sort of things. And then we also have our uh, signal analysis pipeline that allows us to uh, mark the features of interest. In some cases, we also have more black box approaches based on deep learning, but this is kind of the primary approach that we've taken to the problem. So in the space of heart failure in particular, and that's what I'll talk about first because a lot of our work has focused on that in the academic side of things. That's where our main R01 was that supported our early uh, development of this technology and deployment in clinical sort of uh, populations. So our work has really been to try to address this gap in heart failure where uh, you know, heart failure is a condition where patients are not able to, uh, their heart is not able to deliver enough oxygen and nutrients to the tissues. Typically, you have a weakened myocardium. And what ends up happening is the body tries to compensate for this lack of ability of the heart by retaining more fluid, by changing various things, you know, autonomically. And what, what occurs is that uh, in a normal person who's healthy, if you start doing these things that the body tries to do to compensate for the weakened heart, you would actually see an increase in output. But in a patient with heart failure, it's actually detrimental. So you have this slow process where the patient actually has these changes that are happening internally that start with increasing filling pressures, autonomic adaptation, and then ultimately lead to symptoms that can be viewed like um, uh, shortness of breath, development of fluid in the uh, extremities as well as the lungs, and basically clinical congestion to the point where they have to be hospitalized. So the gap is that the existing technologies that are out there, that can measure the original changes in filling pressures that predate that hospitalization, we know now by two, almost three weeks, are all implantable devices that are expensive and only accessible to the small portion of the 6 million patients with heart failure in the U.S., and on the other side, the non-invasive sensing devices that can be deployed in larger populations sense things that are very late in terms of this sort of hemodynamic progression towards hospitalization. So what we wanted to build was a non-invasive device that could provide an early indication 
of this worsening condition that could then allow for greater access to the kind of care that people get when they have these implantable devices like CardioMEMS. And so the patient would wear uh, this device. It could be a spot check where they wear it once a day, could end up being a more continuous monitor. From that uh, device, we would have algorithms that could derive important information clinically regarding their status. Specifically, where we want to head is filling pressures, because that's what's been shown to give the earliest indicator of worsening condition and heart failure. And then with the clinician in the loop, we could then uh, reevaluate and change drug dosages like diuretic dosages, as is the case in standard sort of paradigms now with implantable devices to do um, hemodynamic guided care. So, of course, because of this, one of the latest studies we've done that directly address this question of whether we could measure these filling pressures with our device. And specifically, we focused first on changes in filling pressure associated with uh, vasodilator infusion in patients with heart failure. We actually took measurements with our patch at the same time as uh, right heart cath signals that were obtained from a catheter that was placed in various places within the patient, starting with the pulmonary artery, uh, going into the right atrium, uh, I'm sorry, going from the right atrium to the right ventricle to then the pulmonary artery to being wedged inside of the uh, pulmonary capillary bed to get the various invasive measurements at the same time as our device and see if we could measure the changes accurately. So you see here for one patient, the on the top, you see the way that the pulmonary artery pressure changes with a vasodilator infusion. And on the left, basically, you see the... Uh, PAP or pulmonary artery pressure in blue is before the vasodilator in red is after the vasodilator. On the right, you see the changes in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure again, before the vasodilator and after the vasodilator. And this is a known result. If you give someone a vasodilator when they have elevated pressures, typically their pressures go down. And that was exactly the idea that we wanted to uh, test because if a patient with heart failure is at home and you give them a drug, does their you know, and that drug affects their physiology, can we measure it with a non-invasive device? And so what we noticed was the corresponding SCG signals, the seismocardiogram signal, in blue here is for the normal case, and in red sort of dotted line is for the case following the vasodilator infusion. And we saw basically changes in both the timing and the amplitude characteristics of the signal, and especially we noted changes in the diastolic portion of the signal, which no one had really examined before, and what's not shown on the slide is also we found that there were changes in the lateral direction of the SCG, in other words, side to side, rather than just in and out of the chest, which kind of makes sense when you think about the direction that the heart is typically being filled inside of the chest. So we had essentially a standard machine learning framework, nothing uh, fancy here really, where we had a held out um, test set on which we determined that we could actually uh, get an accurate representation of the changes in pulmonary capillary wedge pressure with our device compared to the gold standard, which was right heart cath. And the data that basically we had in terms of comparison to right heart catheterization was the basis for uh, the company CardioSense receiving FDA breakthrough designation for this technology for patients with heart failure recently. So um, scientifically, then, if you think about sort of this wearable device that can capture aspects that are relevant to internal filling and pressure characteristics of the heart. It would be interesting to think about not just the case of volume overload, which is heart failure, but also what happens if you have too low blood volume. So that's the case of hypovolemia. So if you think about this sort of uh, starling curve you know, relationship that's well known in cardiovascular physiology, where if you take a normal heart that's shown in orange here, and if you increase the filling of the heart, you actually get increased performance. That's sort of known. So if you're, for example, this is why, you know, I guess oversimplifying things, but this is why blood doping would work, right? If you create more blood, you have more blood volume, then your heart is going to perform better. That's a sort of a dumb example, but I guess gets the point across. At the same time, if you have someone who is sitting at a normal blood volume and they start to lose blood, let's say because they're shot or stabbed or they've been in a car accident and they have you know trauma that causes them to start losing a bunch of blood volume, their ventricular performance is going to degrade. 
And so on one side, you have someone with heart failure where you have increased blood volume. On the other side, you have somebody, say, with hypovolemia that has reduced blood volume. And so our interest was to better understand the science of how reduced blood volume can impact the relationship between these invasive pressures and the non-invasive signals that we measure with our patch. I want to just make a quick note here to say that reduced blood volume can be both absolute and relative. And I think this is important because a lot of people hear me sort of talk about hypovolemia and the way that we try to assess it with our patch. And they think first about, of course, the military applications, which is definitely a very relevant application of this, sort of the application of hemorrhage. But at the same time, there's actually many different ways that you can have reduced blood volume uh, that are outside of that as well. One would be dehydration, for example, if you're performing exercise in the heat and you're losing volume because of sweating, and ultimately that comes from sort of uh, loss of blood volume, that's sort of absolute hypovolemia. At the same time, if you have sort of a stable blood volume status, but at the same time you're trying to fill a greater capacity, you can have relative hypovolemia. In either of these, we believe that having our wearable sort of patched together with the right kind of algorithms that we can estimate volume status and then drive basically emergency care decisions accordingly. Those could be decisions like triage. They could also be decisions regarding fluid um, uh, resuscitation and other sorts of therapies that are used. And this was in close collaboration, this work with uh, Professor Jino Han from University of Maryland. So we performed an animal study for this work because of the fact that, uh, again, very little was understood about how these signals react to changes in volume status, especially in the sort of hypovolemia direction. So uh, in this case, we had all of the internal pressures measured with catheters. Uh, we had, again, a seismocardiography and photoplethysmogram measurements together with ECG on the outside of the body, and we used basically algorithms to try to derive our estimate of volume status and compared that to the actual volume status for these pigs in the study and found actually there was a good monotonic relationship between the two of them. So, of course, a lot of our work has been very focused on cardiac disease and cardiac performance, but at the same time, uh, I do want to note that we've done some work recently that's been more focused on using these signals to reflect uh, underlying autonomic state and reactivity, and especially this has been in the context of non-invasive neuromodulation therapies. But so um, the way that the, you know, the way that the brain processes sensory inputs and the way that that results in physiological changes is sort of well understood in the existing literature. And specifically, there are changes related to the heart, the lungs, and sort of, uh, you know, sweat markers that people have keyed in on to be able to assess these things. And so some of our most recent work, uh, together with uh, colleagues at Emory University that are in cardiology, as well as epidemiology and psychiatry, has been to kind of uh, provide a non-invasive alternative to some of the tools they've been using previously to assess mental stress reactivity in patients with uh, former heart attacks. So basically, after patients have myocardial infarction, if they're exposed to mental stressors, like a mental public speaking task, then the way they react to that task can actually um, tell you information about their risk of cardiac events downstream. That's something that this team has already found, um, led by Dr. Kayumi, Vaccarino, and Bremner in particular. And so the question is, can you actually get some of the markers that they've found previously with more expensive or invasive approaches with our non-invasive patch? So that's some, one of the things we're currently working on. Um, and through that, there's a question of, you know, what types of markers should we be focused on? These are just a couple of markers from our device we've used before to understand the responses and the uh, physiological signals to various different types of stressors. And we've examined also the way, as I mentioned, we've examined the way that these sorts of parameters with sort of the wearable measurement systems respond to different therapies also, in addition to mental stressors. You know, as you use non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation, for example, we did quite a bit of work in patients with PTSD as well as opioid use disorder during active withdrawal to determine how these signals changed in those patients as they were uh, being stimulated with this active device to try to reduce their kind of physiological reactivity to stress or basically their sympathetic tone. And then kind of the last thing I'll talk about in the cardiac 
side of things, this is not really related to vibrations, but we've also been doing some work on adding other modalities to our wearable patch. So this is some of the work we've done on adding uh, impedance tomography to be able to get better measures of respiratory uh, parameters like respiratory rate and tidal volume as well from the chest. And so this is an area that we're expanding on currently in the lab uh, to try to have a full cardiopulmonary assessment capability on this, on this wearable. Uh, and part of that has been on the hardware side, as I showed on the previous slide, part of it has also been in terms of the algorithms to try to have better ways of fusing the different sensor modalities so that you can estimate respiration rate from the sensors that we have when one of the sensors maybe gives out because of noise or some other corruption, you can use the other sensor to be able to do this. So we did some nice work that was published about a year ago in JBHI uh, that focused on how to extract respiratory rate accurately with this wearable patch based signals. So with that, I'll transition. I know that that uh, is supposed to be somewhat short, I guess 45 minutes. So I'll transition to some of our work on uh, joint health monitoring that is, you know, you'll see some similarities across these two works, particular in terms of the multimodal sensing approaches, as well as in terms of better understanding these uh, non-traditional sensing modalities through scientific experiments uh, that I think is really important for this field. So um, you may not know this unless you've had a knee injury or have arthritis, but actually it's very common that people go to the doctor with knee problems. So there's about 18 million patient visits each year in the U.S. alone because of injuries and uh, chronic disease related to the knee. And again, if you've been a patient, you know this, but if not, you may be surprised to hear that the kind of approaches that are usually used to make really important decisions, like, for example, maybe some of you are fans of Aaron Rodgers, you know, just a name drop. There's a person, he had a major unfortunately, Achilles injury at the beginning of the season. And those types of injuries, as well as ACL tears and other sorts of sports injuries that are super prevalent, take months to uh, recover from. And the whole process involves kind of this initial diagnosis, which may have medical imaging and some subjective sort of physical exam characteristics, and then some rehabilitation, of course, a lot of rehabilitation, and then periodically throughout the rehabilitation, there are some subjective decisions that are made regarding, you know, is the person ready to start a uh, more aggressive kind of strength training? Are they ready to do cutting exercises or jumping? Uh, and then ultimately, are they ready to get back to their sport and return to play? So it's this very difficult process that takes months and months and requires actually a lot of fine grain, uh, important decisions to be made. But those decisions are mainly based on either really expensive things like imaging, um, infrequent things like physical exam uh, with a professional you know, ortho who can actually see the knee and determine what's going on, or subjective determinations that are made as well. So our overall concept and vision was that people wear knee braces all the time. What can we sort of build into these braces to be able to better characterize the physiological and structural aspects of knee health that can then help some of these decisions to be made on a more objective and frequently measured uh, basis, basically a data-driven kind of approach. So this was kind of the concept that we wanted to pursue. And one of the first signals that we started looking at, actually I had a background in acoustic sensing and was super interested in, um, in miniaturized acoustic sensors and also at the same time, I had kind of an athletics background myself uh, in college. I was a discus thrower. So I had sort of an understanding of, of, you know, knee pain and how maybe we might be able to sense some parameters of the knee with acoustics. So one of the areas we started uh, looking into very heavily as a lab was knee sounds in particular. And as the knee moves and you have these sort of frictional rubbing of internal surfaces within the knee, how do the sounds from that tell you about what's going on inside? So I'd like to play for you a couple of example sounds here. One is going to be from a healthy knee at first, and then we'll listen to a knee that has osteoarthritis. And on the next slide, we'll listen to a knee that has an ACL tear, and then kind of we'll talk about it. So I think the healthy knee you'll notice is 
fairly quiet in this case is not always the case, but um, uh, that's sort of what we find here. This is now an age-matched person with osteoarthritis. Quite a bit more rubbing and frictional sort of stuff going on there. So this is for a person with an ACL tear. So with this one, you hear probably a little bit more instability and sort of some um, uh, kind of periodic pops that occur and clicks that occur as the person is moving the leg. And kind of that's sort of this laxity that you expect from someone with ACL tear. These aren't this simple normally. I mean, actually, in many cases, you can you know, listen to these and it's very hard to tell what's going on. But I just wanted to give you some examples here, you know, to understand the nature of what kind of signal we're looking at. Oh, sorry. So for the next next slide, I have some images of a cadaver uh, limb. So if that's going to be disturbing to you, then, then maybe just, you know, this might be time to make a quick espresso and come back. So uh, we had to do some work early on. There was actually very little work, if any, that had been done on examining how knee sounds change with injury. And so we had to do some very basic studies in cadaver specimens, basically fresh frozen cadavers that had the right mechanical characteristics to be able to um, examine the way these sounds kind of reflect uh, in, in a way that, that actually reflects um, in vivo populations as well. And so for these populations, what we did for the cadaver model was we actually induced a meniscus tear through a surgery, and then we compared the sounds occurring in the knee before and after the meniscus tear. So we got direct kind of before and after comparisons, and we could tell basically what sorts of features changed in the context of the injury. Um, our group has also done quite a bit of work now on instrumenting knee braces to capture acoustics with various packaging and housing. Uh, we did a modular device on the right side that could be used with different knee sizes. We also built, uh, in addition to the sounds, we actually have electrical bioimpedance uh, at multiple frequencies built into the braces as well with electrodes that are kind of proximal and distal to the knee joint, as well as kinematics measures through IMU. So it kind of gives a full-fledged uh, assessment of the physiology and structure of the knee. Um, that sort of irregularity and kind of uh, um, randomness, I guess you were hearing from the ACL tear we were able to capture that uh, quantitatively with uh, with kind of a graph-based approach where essentially if you look at sort of control subject, injured subject, and injured subject after surgery here, you can see that the KNN plot of the, uh, of the window kind of knee sound parameters for the control subject has fewer kind of groupings than you get with the injured subject. There's basically more heterogeneity in the injured subjects in terms of the characteristics of these sounds. The injured subject after surgery, that sort of heterogeneity starts to go away and you start to look more like a control subject. And this was something that we were able to quantify actually for the 44 uh, student athletes that we measured these sounds from. Nine of them had injuries and they had a higher what's called graph community factor, which basically just quantified what I just explained. And the 35 of them had a lower graph community factor. There's a significant difference there. There's also a significant reduction for the ones where we had post-surgery results. Um, from the arthritis side of things, we've done a good amount of work in combining these sounds with bioimpedance and kinematics measures in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. This was basically a clinical trial that was being done at Minnesota, where the main goal was to evaluate a neuromodulation technology that uh, group out of University of Minnesota was developing. And then while they were doing that, we were able to get measurements with our technology as well and compare against the gold standard clinical exam uh, assessment of disease activity, which is basically this classification plot shown on the right. So we had an approach where with the sounds, we were able to detect overall systemic inflammation. And then with the kinematics and bioimpedance, we were able to get at the uh, swelling and, and tenderness and pain of the different joints 
Um, overall, we were able to classify disease activity with an area under the curve of 0.82 for that population. And it's actually a very similar result to what we got in uh, classifying arthritis, juvenile arthritis in kids. This is for 116 total participants that were recruited at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. My main clinical collaborator for this was uh, Dr. Uh, Prahalad, who is the chair of pediatric rheumatology uh, at Children's and Emory. And, and this is our, you know, we recently published this actually this year in pediatric rheumatology. And there was some difference actually even between inactive and active JIA. That's a sort of more uh, subtle point that maybe if you're interested, we can talk about it in sort of the Q&A. But basically, we need more information on that to better understand you know, how well we're really characterizing active and inactive GIA on the clinical gold standard side of things. And currently, we're uh, focused on trying to better uh, evaluate that from the clinical side of things so that we can have a good gold standard to compare against. Uh, we did some work as well very recently on determining, on basically using active sensing of uh, vibrations through the joint, and specifically this was on the Achilles tendon. So we think of this as kind of like plucking a guitar string in some ways. And, and as the Achilles tendon tightens or loosens when the person is sort of loading it, there's actually a difference in its stiffness. And so as you vibrate it with an external vibration motor, and as you measure the vibrations of the tendon then with an accelerometer at various points on the tendon, we found that you can actually determine how much is being loaded, which is kind of an interesting result for biomechanics literature and essentially, some of the most recent work we've been doing has been thinking about how some of these sounds can be used not just for monitoring chronic diseases and injuries, but also how this may be valuable for human performance and biomechanics applications as well. And so this actually, this work is very focused on that. So we wanted to take uh, bioimpedance measures, not with the brace, but actually with separate uh, sort of devices that went proximal and distal to the joint higher up and sort of lower down so that it would capture not just the joint itself, but the muscles around the joint. And we performed uh, a study that was really a longitudinal study of, uh, uh, of fatiguing exercises for the person over the course of 13 days. And these signals were measured at home as well as in the lab. And the idea was we wanted to determine how well we could uh, characterize two things during these asymmetric fatiguing sort of protocols. One is we wanted to determine how well we could determine the, uh, quantify the fatigue level. And that was compared to a dynamometer test where the person actually uh, tested their level of muscle fatigue in their quadriceps muscles by doing sort of extension uh, exercises with dynamometer. And the second thing was we wanted to see how well we could predict the delayed onset muscle soreness or DOMS that results from these fatiguing activities. So if any of you have done this sort of excessively fatiguing, let's say exercises in the gym, you might actually work out on day one and then you might not be sore until day three. And it's very challenging then to sort of predict how much you should be pushing yourself on day two and three in your sort of training regimen because you may actually get injured if you push it too far. So on the left here, what you find is something that you, again, if you've done this, you may be familiar with this, but the person's self-reported estimate of exercise intensity and how much pain they'll be in in the next two days has zero capability of predicting their delayed pain level. So you perform this fatiguing exercises today. You may think that I'm in tune with my body. I'll know, you know how, uh, how fatigued I am two days later. Actually, it's very difficult to predict that um, because this, this sort of... Um, uh, physiological mechanisms behind DOMS involve edema and the slow sort of changes over the course of a couple of days. And so what we could find, though, because of the fact that it does involve sort of the movement of fluid in and out of the muscles and the joint and the uh, extracellular fluid kind of going into the inside of cells, what we could find was with the bioimpedance, we were able to accurately estimate the delayed onset muscle soreness two days later with the values that were taken during the exercise itself. So this is pretty cool. So we think of this as maybe a way that you could use this device to uh, sort of tune your training levels based on how much you're actually fatiguing the muscle rather than what you're perceiving. And this is just uh, some data then showing the second part of things, which is how much muscle force reduction 
there actually is. So how much the person actually fatigued their joint and their muscles around the joint compared to what the device uh, predicted. And again, there was a close correlation here. And I think it's due to the same mechanism. So some of this work is, of course, ongoing, and we have to do more to better understand why we're getting these relationships. And so using these signals for biomechanics applications is sort of a newer area that our lab is super interested in. Okay, so with that, I'll kind of close and just thank, of course, the students and the collaborators and our funding agencies. And these are just some of them that are shown here. And I'd love to take some questions and, and kind of interact with you guys and get your thoughts. Awesome. Thanks, Homer. Um, Vivek, do you want people to type questions into the chat or what's the mechanism? Oh, they can, yeah, they can ask, uh, you know, that very, very interesting book. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, I had a question, Omar. It's very intriguing in attempting to quantify what happens with our, within these complex joints on basis of noise and and the your capacity to separate artifacts from you know what is a very complex anatomical uh, uh, condition. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that that the what we have done so far has been to prescribe the movement that the person is doing very carefully while we're taking the measurements. So for example, we don't just have them put on the brace and, you know, just do your normal thing all day and we'll see what we get. It's more like the activity is paired with the brace. So you'll put on the brace and then you'll extend and flex your joint 10 times. Maybe you'll do 10 squats as well. There might be some walking activities, but very controlled, like maybe walk 10 feet, walk 10 feet back. And so by doing that, still we found there's artifacts, of course, and a big chunk of what we did was how to deal with cable artifacts, cable movement, vibration, and we had to deal with you know what adhesives to use and sort of the way to package the sensors to optimize the uh, sort of signal fidelity. There's a lot on that side, for sure. That's a big problem. Like that's not an easy problem by any means. Dealing with stepping noise, for example. Um, but at the very least, then it becomes a much more tractable problem because it's a controlled, you know what movements the person is doing. You can, for example, tell, um, you know, which point of the joint cycle they're in. And is that the point in the joy cycle where you're starting to get these sounds that are of interest? And so that's been a very important part of it, for sure. Interesting. Very, because, uh, oh, 35 years ago, we were working on the temporomandibular joint to see if we could quantify uh, oh, yeah. the problems in the, in the joint through acoustics. And yes. the heterogeneity of these uh, joint, joint, joint sounds, you know? Uh, the the joints are so complex and there's so much of uh, different tissues like cartilage, ligaments, bone, each of them provide different acoustic signals. I'm curious uh, what kind of machine learning approaches, if any, uh, are there available to filter out? Yeah, actually interesting you should say that. We worked on uh, the temporomandibular joint as well with a, a collaborator and we actually had a harder time classifying. So we, we did publish our results, but the results were poorer than what we got from the knee, which kind of, um, I guess it kind of surprised me, but I'm also not as much in that field. So I wasn't sure. I mean, for so specifically for kids with GIA, we had kids with GIA that had uh, um, sort of uh, temporal mandibular joint involvement, TMJ involvement, and kids that did not have, so we, so we had kind of four, four categories. One was healthy controls, no temporal mandibular joint involvement. One was healthy controls with TMJ involvement. One was GIA, no TMJ involvement. One was GIA with TMJ involvement. Because we wanted to understand for the kids in particular, was it more the GIA or was it more the TMJ that we were sensing? And we thought actually it would be a very, nice kind of tractable problem. But what we found was TMJ involvement versus not, there was a better classification there, uh, but still not that strong. TMJ plus 
arthritis, uh, you know, very difficult to tell the difference between those two things. But I guess what I'm saying is that that was a, that was from what we found actually a much harder problem than let's say detecting arthritis versus not in the knees. Mm -hmm. I think part of it is it's a bigger joint. So similar to if you have a small speaker versus a large speaker, right? If you have a large speaker, you're probably producing uh, lower frequency sounds, broader bandwidth, and actually they're probably louder. And so for the knee, I think your signal source is actually much better. And also you're not, you're kind of, um, your proximity to the joint space doesn't require going through all of the ligaments and everything as well, right? Because you can kind of sit in the soft space to sort of uh, medially and laterally to the kneecap. And so I think actually with the knee, that's that's a nice kind of advantage. And it has been harder for us, for example, for the ankle. For the wrist, you can also get some good sounds. But TMJ was actually one of the hardest uh, ones we worked with, I guess. So I'm not surprised that uh, you guys had challenges with that as well. In terms of the machine learning, I mean, there's uh, there's a lot of different approaches we've, we've used. I think that um, for one, the fact that we have the kinematics at the same time allows us to separate out the cycles. And so our windows that we use as our sort of instances for training involve not just the whole waveform kind of shoved together, but actually each flexion extension cycle. And so it's kind of keyed into a kinematic event that again, I think allows the algorithms to discern portions of that cycle that are more informative than others. And uh, we even have some recent work where we're specifically trying to key into that deliberately. Um, the actual classification algorithms and that kind of thing, I mean, we've used standard sort of conventional approaches, XGBoost, you know, even logistic regression in the simplest sort of clinical cases. So that's that hasn't been, you know, we haven't had to do much in terms of innovation there. Interesting. So Omar, um, I wanted to ask you a question as well. Um, would you speak a bit to individual differences and in how they kind of play a role in these algorithms in particular with regards to like, you know, person specific calibrations and things of that nature? Yeah, so for the, uh, it's a great question. It, it kind of depends on the problem and it depends on uh, the types of signals. So for the, for the cardiac signals, actually, we found that there's less need for this sort of individual calibration kind of approaches, except for uh, anything we've tried in the field of cuffless blood pressure monitoring, which I think is just a very, very difficult problem. I think that uh, from what I've seen, nobody has a good solution to that. There's even been recent studies like Microsoft Aurora, where they did large data sets and had actually uh, negative results that they published kind of in that area. I think it's a very difficult problem. Um, and and I, I do think for that, you know, I, most likely someone will need to do individual calibration, though I don't know. Maybe there's approaches that don't require that. Um, for our work, though, for the wedge pressure, for example, for the mm -hmm. filling pressure monitoring, we have not had to do any uh, person-specific calibration. Part of that is, you know, for that particular paper that I was talking about, it was relative changes in wedge pressure. And so by that, there was already kind of a normalization to that person. Part of it's also that I think that... Um, the meaning in terms of the hemodynamics of, say, elevated wedge pressure is pretty fairly common across patients with heart failure. So you're congested, you know, you have high wedge pressure, your hemodynamics are going to be suffering for that. But I still think there's a lot of information that needs to be better understood. We have ideas that, that we want to pursue in larger populations. I think it will be needed to better understand, for example, HEF-PEF versus HEF-REF and how that impacts these signals. I think there are, at the very least, sort of phenotypic considerations that have to be taken there. Uh, for the joint sounds, I think there's a lot of differences across people. Uh, there's differences across age. I, that, that one, I think, is just so much further in terms of how much needs to be understood um, to even answer that question. I think there's definitely individual-specific differences. In kids, that's been easier because kids without arthritis don't have much in terms of sound to their knees. And so it's easier to classify sort of arthritis versus not, at least, and disease activity level. For adults, it's really tough. It's a really tough problem. 
And I guess following on that, and this is really just more kind of speculation, just curious to get your thoughts. So in, in sort of a model of medicine where you have, you know, large sort of normative populations and you characterize conditions in a, in a kind of average case sense, then, you know, in some sense, it's it's relatively straightforward to define absolute level. You have this, mm -hmm. this large population to draw from and you can just kind of titrate it and stratify in various ways. Um, as you move more towards personalized medicine, then you can imagine for each individual having a kind of a historical record of, of a variety of signals. And then I wonder in that setting whether relative measures would be you know, more powerful and maybe at the same time more amenable to a lot of these sensing technologies that have a hard time, you know, getting that same absolute reference that you give with a clinical procedure. Yeah, no, I, I agree completely. I think that that's, that's, that's a really great point. I think the only reason now that we're so stuck on absolute measures is because of the fact that all of the sort of therapeutic approaches are based exactly. on that, right? Yeah, that's right. And that's, that's what makes it difficult. But, mm -hmm. you know, Who's to know, like, if, if my blood pressure is 130 over 80, maybe it's completely fine. But maybe if it was, like, 100 over 60 yesterday and it went to 130 over 80, maybe it actually means something really important. And it's just, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult with the current sort of state of things to get around that. But I think longer term, I, I totally agree with you. I think that that sort of time history and the way that the way that our sort of physiology and the way these signals change will be more informative and these sensors exactly are, are better suited, I think, for right. detecting those kinds of changes, right? Awesome. There were a couple of uh, comments in the in the, uh, in the the chat. Oh. Uh, I haven't been monitoring it. Can you see them, Omer? I can open it up. Yeah, here we go. Okay, cool. Sorry, yeah, I haven't been looking at the chat at all. Sorry. No worries. Okay. We were distracting you. Yes, that's good though. Okay, did you try consumer devices such as smartphone? smartphone? Yeah, I mean, so the tricky thing is that actually, so there's a couple couple things here going on. So one is that the the way you measure sounds from the body, if you think about how a stethoscope works, it's not actually just sort of a microphone placed in close proximity to your chest. It's actually a vibration transducer. So the stethoscope head is like a little drum head and your skin is kind of vibrating with the acoustics internally and those are causing the stethoscope head to vibrate as well. And so if you actually want to sort of um, customize a stethoscope to be able to measure sounds, you sort of stick a microphone into the tubing and, and glue it in there. That's how you would do it. Or you'd put an accelerometer on the stethoscope head to measure those vibrations. So um, that said, the, the sort of phone also has accelerometers. So you kind of shove it against the chest and measure with an accelerometer. And there are groups trying to do that for seismocardiography. There's actually a group out of Belgium that's trying to commercialize the technology as well out of their group. Um, I personally think it's tricky to get high fidelity recordings when you don't have direct mechanical coupling to the chest through something like an adhesive. I think there's some major challenges there also in terms of positioning and sort of um, the direction of the sounds and all this sort of thing. But um, but it's an interesting it's an interesting approach. Uh, looks like your second question is regarding knee health monitoring braces. How close is it to move into clinical practice? It's it's far from in terms of the uh, sounds, uh, it's pretty far. In terms of the bioimpedance, actually, that's that's kind of what we're focusing on in this company, Arthroba. That's a newer company, but but uh, I think we have good reason to believe that actually we can be, uh, the, in fact, ACL reconstruction and ACL sort of rehab is one of the main sort of clinical areas we're interested in there. Uh, oh, you care. Great. Thanks for your question. Let me see. So as we all know electrical conductivity and permittivity of muscle is highly anisotropic. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. So, so with the, uh, with the bioimpedance, there's, there's kind of, um, no, we don't do orthogonal components using an array. That's kind of interesting. That's an interesting question. Um, but in our case, I'm not sure if this sort of level of, uh, what, what you're saying, I think it might be more sort of microscopic effect, right. Than than macroscopic. I mean, for us, Electrode placement plays a role for sure, but because we're doing a spectroscopic measurement, which is sort of across multiple frequencies, and because especially we look at the way that the spectroscopy changes with movement in particular. So the, we have a kinematic measures of, let's say, flexion extension while the person is performing their activity, and then we're measuring sort of the spectroscopy through the overall region and the way that changes also with the activity. What we see is actually very clearly the sort of movement of fluid 
um, within that space because of the change in the ratio of low frequency to high frequency bioimpedance. So I think it probably normalizes out some of this uh, concern that you have. And I think also it could be a more macro level. I think what you're saying is really important, but it may be more on the micro scale level if we were doing, say, the bioimpedance of a single sort of isolated muscle fascicle or something. I don't know. It's an interesting question. I could also be wrong. Depends on the sensor size also, obviously. I have not read your paper. I should, but yes. Uh, yeah. Sensor size, uh, I think uh, if in the millimeter range, you are right, it'll average out. If you are smaller than that, it may not average out. Yeah, we're, um, I mean, across the whole sort of, we're probably more in the centimeters kind of range, I think. With the that. Another quick question. Uh, what yeah. frequency range are you using for spectroscopy? Uh, five kilohertz to a hundred kilohertz typically. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. We, we use the same for heart. That's why I was asking. We use uh, it is the same. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Are there any other questions for Omer? So maybe I have one one more to ask if nobody else has one. So. I'm curious, Omar, what, what are your thoughts around kind of data sets in this area? And I ask in part because we've seen the, you know, the tremendous progress that's been made in other areas of AI where just through fortuitous happenstance, you know, large scale data sets were available at essentially no cost, like images on the internet, that kind of thing. We know that that the absence of those, you know, of those data sets is a barrier in many other areas of AI. What are your thoughts around the possibility of getting some kind of equivalently large amounts of data in this area that you're working in? Yeah, I mean, I think that the, I guess the first step could be partnerships with hospitals, right, and hospital systems, because while they don't have wearable sensor data, they actually have some similar sensor modalities that they measure all the time. Yeah, you know, ECG, PPG, these sorts of signals are measured in hospital equipment regularly for hours and hours of, of uh, patient stays, sometimes days and days. So I think that that would be the, you know, if more data sets like Mimic, for example, Mimic 3, this kind of things, vital DB could be available, that could be really cool, I think. Um, I think that, that we're probably still a ways away from having the size of data sets required for um, some larger efforts, I think, like you're sort of describing. But I think that's that would be a huge step when we when we do have that available. Hey, Omar, uh, I have one more question. Uh, thank sure. you for nice talk. So, one question regarding the stroke volume. So, did you try measuring stroke volume in any other part of the body, for example, ear, ear location, um, instead of patch on the chest? Um. We didn't do, so you mean like seismocardiogram recording from other locations? Right, or, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't done too much of that. We've done some work like clavicle and sort of other places on the chest. From the ear, you wouldn't really get a seismocardiogram. You get kind of a wearable ballistocardiogram, which we have sort of examined a little bit. Um, there was a group out of MIT that did a lot of work. David Hay, Eric Winokur, and Charlie Sudini's lab that did a lot of work uh, about maybe 15 years ago on sort of ear-based vitals. And that was one of the signals that they were measuring at that time too. I mean, I think there's, it's a good question. I'm not sure what the level of information that you can gain from there is compared to the chest. Um, I think in some ways from the chest, because you're kind of right at the heart, maybe some of these other lateral direction signals and diastolic component of the SCG would be easier to gather than it would be from something like the ear. But it could be there's some more holistic measures as well that that um, that would be relevant from the ear. I'm not sure. You'd have to sort of study it, I think, directly for stroke volume in particular. Thank you. I think we're we're pretty much at time at this point. Uh, shall we uh, wrap things up and thank our speaker one last time? Great. Omar, Thanks. thank you very much.